Hello, Dr. John Kavanaugh, and this is still AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, and now we're going to do Lesson 8, Part 2. Let's talk about other participants in the courtroom drama. Uh, court officers, sometimes called bailiffs. Court officers are armed law enforcement officers who keep order in the court, announce the judge's entry, swear in witnesses, prevent the escape of remanded defendants, and a remanded defendant is one who is in jail, and they also watch sequestered juries. Uh, a sequestered jury is a jury which is not allowed to go home at night. Instead, they're all put up in a hotel somewhere and their ability to read newspapers or watch television related for articles and information related to the case is uh, curtailed so that they can't be influenced because the only thing jurors are supposed to consider is what is admitted into evidence in court. And on TV, there, there may be all sorts of uh, information which is not allowed in court, be, be it inflammatory, false, prejudicial, you know, who knows. Okay. That's court officers. Oh, by the way, in some jurisdictions, the local police are, are the court officers. In other jurisdictions, they have separate officers. Uh, New York City has an entirely separate uh, job title called court officer, uh, and they're, they're peace officers, and uh, they're employed by the courts. Whereas in Maricopa County, the Maricopa County Sheriff's offices are the court officers. Uh, if you go to court, you'll see them standing usually in the back of the courtroom. Now let's look at court recorders, also called court reporters, not to be confused with press reporters, which are different, or court stenographers. These people create a written record of all occurrences and conversations in the court, including conferences out of earshot of the jury and spectators up by the judge near the uh, judge's dais. Um, so what the written transcript looks like is a play, like a school play. It'll have the name of the person followed by exactly what that person says, the exact words. And if the person uh, motions, gestures, holds up something, it'll be noted what they did. Uh, this written record uh, is of everything that takes place in the court. And um, basically, uh, it's used if there's an appeal. The appellate courts will read the written record to see if, in fact, uh, a claim by one of the lawyers that the judge erred uh, is true or false. Uh, they will also strike inadmissible statements from the record. Uh, sometimes a question will be asked, and before the other attorney can uh, say objection, the witness blurts out the answer. Uh, if the judge rules that that statement is not admissible, then that will be stricken from the official record of the trial, and the judge will tell the jury to disregard that information. However, if what was said is extremely prejudicial uh, to the case, the, the judge could declare a mistrial, and then the prosecutor would have to decide to start an entirely new trial with an entirely new jury. Court clerks. They maintain the court records, and they issue jury summonses and subpoenas. Uh, they also accept items into evidence, and they may sometimes swear in witnesses during the trial, the trial or hearing. Let's talk about expert witnesses. Now, expert witnesses are persons with special knowledge, recognized by the court, and they can express opinions and draw conclusions from the evidence. See, that's the big difference between an expert witness and a regular or lay witness. Uh, lay witnesses can only testify as to what they saw, heard, smelt, felt, touched. Uh, they more or less like a tape recorder. They play back what they experienced. Whereas an expert witness can be asked questions based upon uh, evidence that was uh, submitted by the expert or other people and can draw a conclusion uh, to, to that effect. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, if uh, a person is arrested for driving while intoxicated. Uh, the, and a lawyer says, uh, in your opinion, uh, the prosecutor says to the police officer who's on the witness stand, was the defendant drunk? Well, assuming that the officer is not an expert witness on intoxication, the officer would not be allowed to render that opinion. The only thing the officer can do is recount what he or she sensed, experienced, saw. So the officer could say, uh, I observed the defendant driving erratically. 
When I pulled the defendant over, I smelled the strong odor of alcoholic beverage on his breath. I observed empty, empty whiskey bottles on the floor. Uh, his, her eyes were bloodshot. Uh, when the person got out of the car, they were staggering. Uh, those are observations which are admissible. But to draw the conclusion that the person was intoxicated can only be done by an expert witness. Now, how does one become an expert witness? Well, expert witnesses, their uh, status as experts is based upon their education. Uh, I mean, it could be a psychiatrist who went to medical school and did a residency in psychiatry, or it could be a police officer who went to a two-week drug recognition course. So education, their position, uh, you know, a forensic uh, pathologist who's the head of forensic pathology at some big hospital, uh, that's status. Their experience, how many years have they been doing this? Um, in addition, uh, their publications. Uh, some professionals do research and they publish their findings in professional journals. So if this particular expert witness, maybe it's, uh, uh, say, uh, footprint plaster analysis, uh, you know, has written articles on how to do that and interpret it and, and have been published in the professional journal of the crime scene people, that would help get them the status of expert. And finally, awards, professional awards related to their knowledge and their service in their field. All of these things combined will cause a judge to rule whether or not the person is an expert witness. Uh, and expert witnesses, by the way, usually deal in scientific areas, medical or uh, in terms of uh, physical evidence analysis. Jurors like expert witnesses. Uh, however, expert witnesses may sometimes confuse jurors, especially if they use complicated tactical jargon, and they can also disagree with each other. It is not uncommon for each side to have an expert witness on the same subject and to have them disagree. All right, the next group of people uh, that we're going to discuss are not part of the courtroom work group, but nevertheless, because they don't work there, but they play a significant role in court. So let's first talk about lay witnesses. Now, lay witnesses are non-expert witnesses called to relate facts about a case or information about the character of the defendant. And these are ones who relate information on the character are called character witnesses. And they usually come in during sentencing, like the, the mother of the uh, person found guilty claiming what a wonderful boy he, 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 he always has been except when he murders people. Uh, victims and defendants may also be called as witnesses. Now witnesses are ordered to appear in court by being given an order to appear called a subpoena and that's Latin and sub means under and pena from a Latin means penalty. So a subpoena is an order to appear in court under penalty of law. So subpoena is Latin for under penalty. If a person disobeys a subpoena, they may be found in contempt of court and be punished. A subpoena that orders a person to bring documents or other objects to court with them is called a subpoena duces tecum, D-U-C-E-S-T-E-C-U-M. And duces tecum in Latin means to bring with you. So maybe this is the chief financial officer of a corporation that's been charged with some financial crimes. The subpoena duke est tecum may require the financial officer to bring in all of the financial records of the, of the company. Uh, okay, so subpoena uh, duke est tecum means to bring with you under penalty. Now, witnesses can only tell what they directly know. Witnesses cannot, this, we're talking about lay witnesses now, they cannot relate what others said since this is hearsay evidence. Uh, for an example, um, if I heard the defendant say, I'm going to kill that woman, right? I could testify to that because I heard it. But if I was told by somebody else who heard it that that's what they heard, if Anne heard the defendant say, I'm going to kill that woman, and then Anne told me, I could not testify to that in court because that is hearsay evidence. Uh, I didn't hear it directly. Uh, and hearsay evidence is a problem because first, you don't know if the information was transmitted accurately. I think we've all played that party game, uh, telephone, where somebody whispers a story into the ear of the first person who repeats it to the second person who witnesses, wh whispers it to the third person. And by the time it goes through 10 people, the story is dramatically changed. So there's a loss of accuracy when uh, the person who didn't actually hear or see what they're testifying to uh, 
get, is not in the courtroom to give the testimony. Uh, in addition, the, the, the prosecution, uh, the defense rather, cannot cross-examine that person to see if they're biased or they're nearsighted or, or some other problem. Okay, witnesses give testimony under oath and they're subject to critical questioning by the other side and this is called cross-examination. And the character and the motives of the witnesses can be challenged under cross-examination. So if I'm the defense attorney and I call a witness, when I question that person, that is direct examination. When the prosecution comes back and questions this person in an attempt to discredit the person or the testimony, that's called cross-examination. And the same is true. Uh, if a, uh, a prosecution calls a defendant, that's direct examination. When the, when the defense attorney goes back, that would be cross-examination. The other side is called, who didn't call, they do the cross. Uh, witnesses are often inconvenienced and treated poorly by the courts, and they get little or no compensation. However, some courts provide extra services for witnesses, uh, perhaps a, a separate uh, break room where they can sit down and read newspapers or watch TV while they're waiting to be called before the judge. All right, let's talk about jurors. Jurors are adult citizens subpoenaed to court to hear the facts of cases in jury trials and to render verdicts. However, some jurors may get to serve on grand juries. Uh, some occupations and convicted felons are excluded or may, not, uh, or may be excused from jury duty. Uh, when I was a police officer, I was generally excluded from any kind of a criminal trial. Uh, a felon, who I was not, uh, would also be excluded from jury trials. So those are some exceptions. Now, how many people are on a jury? Well, most juries contain six to 12 regular jurors and one or two alternates who replace jurors removed or who cannot serve for whatever reason. Everybody thinks of 12 jurors, but that's not a magic number. Some jurisdictions have six or nine. Uh, there'll always be one or two alternates. So if halfway through the trial, one juror gets sick or is removed for, for cause, maybe they uh, uh, visited the crime scene without permission, uh, there's an alternate who's been sitting there listening to all the testimony who can now become a regular juror and deliberate when the uh, uh, after the closing arguments. Juries ideally consist of a cross-section of society so that the defendant is tried by his or her peers. We're, we're entitled to a jury of your peers. Uh, thus, courts may not allow particular types of individuals or groups to be excluded, uh, especially like racial groups. Uh, so you generally, they get a jury of your peers by picking the names from common public lists. Uh, voter registration rolls were used for many years and they still are, but a lot of people didn't register to vote because they didn't want to do jury duty. So now they also include listings from public utilities like water bills or motor vehicle driver's licenses. So it's pretty hard to avoid having your name on the list of people who can be called in uh, to do jury duty. All right, the victim. The victim, if there is one, and he or she is alive, is often the forgotten party in the process. Victims may be excluded from the trial because they're witnesses, and they're often ignorant about the proceedings, and they're inconvenienced by delays, and often they're not told the outcome. Uh, victims may also be brutally cross-examined and may also fear later retaliation. It is not nice to be a victim, so try and avoid that. Uh, victims, by the way, can't sit in on a trial. Anybody who's going to be called as a witness cannot sit in and listen to what other people are saying because that would influence their testimony. So they're excluded from the trial. Uh, and of course, uh, most people don't understand the courtroom rules, so they become confused. There are delays. Um, and uh, there were many cases where victims were never even told what happened afterwards. Although in Arizona, we have a victim's right clause in the Constitution, which requires uh, victims to, to, among other things, get notifications of what's happening with the case. Uh, some jurisdictions have victim assistance programs to help victims get compensation uh, and to make the judicial process less negative towards them. All right, the defendant. Defendants are usually present at all steps of the process, although they may voluntarily stay away or they may be removed from the courtroom if they are disruptive. Uh, when that happens, they will generally be placed in a separate room outside the courtroom with a TV monitor so they can 
see and hear what's happening, and a telephone which allows them to communicate with their attorney. Defendants are usually poor, powerless, uneducated, and ignorant of the proceedings. You definitely don't want to be a defendant. Defendants are allowed to represent themselves even if they are not lawyers. Generally, outside of limited jurisdiction courts, uh, you have to be an attorney to practice before a courtroom. The exception is if you're defending yourself, then you don't have to be an attorney. You have a right to do that. Although there's an old saying that, uh, that uh, a uh, person who represents himself uh, has a fool for a client uh, because you're prejudiced and you don't know the law. So it's really best to stick with an attorney. Defendants ultimately, if they choose, decide how their lawyers handle their case and what plea, if any, to take. Remember, lawyers are consuls. They, they tell the defendant what's going on, what their options are, but ultimately, whether to take a plea or, or not is a question for the defendant, him or herself. Finally, spectators and the press. Spectators and the press have the right to be at most proceedings because we have an open court system which is guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment which guards against uh, secrecy and corruption and treachery. Uh, going back into the Middle Ages, they had secret court proceedings called star chamber proceedings where people were railroaded and found guilty because they were politically unpopular. Well, we have an open court system and it guards against this type of abuse. Now, the press acts as the representatives of all the people who could not or did not go to watch the case. Almost all trials are open, and if it's a high-profile case that people are interested in, you will have reporters covering it, uh, and you can read about it in the newspapers or online, whatever your, whatever your source of news is. Now, one problem the press creates is the creation of pretrial publicity that may make it hard to get impartial jurors. Uh, remember, uh, jurors are only allowed to consider evidence which is admitted and allowed into testimony by the judge. All the pretrial publicity uh, may, may include a lot of information that is not admissible. And people who read newspaper articles before the trial very often are prejudiced by that information. And a judge will query them on what they know about the case. And if it's too prejudicial, they'll be excluded from jury duty. Uh, if not, they'll simply be told that they cannot consider that. Uh, if the publicity is particularly intense in the area where the crime took place, they will sometimes move the trial to a different location in the state. And that is called a change of venue or change of location. And that is uh, for the trial and it's needed because of a lot of pre-trial publicity, which has basically polluted the jury tool, pool, potential jurors, in the area where the crime took place. Also, sometimes non-sequestered jurors find out information about the case they were not supposed to know. Uh, a non-sequestered juror might be at home and might hear it on TV and listen, or might pick up a newspaper and see a headline which suggests information which uh, is not admissible. Uh, and that could be grounds for a, re uh, for a mistrial uh, if, in fact, the information is so highly prejudiced that the judge rules that, that jury knowing that uh, just totally pollutes uh, the, the ability of that jury to be impartial. Now, if there are an alternate that didn't hear that, they might drop that jury and, and put an alternate into place also. Uh, some courts even allow TV cameras to film trials and other proceedings, although this sometimes causes uh, too much theatrics uh, by the participants. Uh, in the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, the judge was accused of playing to the cameras because that trial was, was uh, televised. Or the lawyers may suddenly you know, get really fiery and oratory because they, they want to be on TV and impress everybody. So most courts don't allow TV cameras. Uh, that's why uh, when you see pictures uh, or even, even uh, still photographs, that's why uh, when in, uh, on the look at the newspapers, you see pictures of trials, it'll very often be a sketch. Uh, the newspapers are allowed to bring in artists to sit in the spectators gallery and draw sketches of the proceedings. Okay, so that is the end of Lesson 8, Part 2. So next you'll be moving on to uh, Lesson 8, Part 3.